The Bible is filled with memorable passages that are intended to lift us up, encourage us, strengthen us, and comfort us. Last Sunday, it was the most famous verse in the world, which has inspired folks to cover their heads with multicolored wigs and paint their bodies with rainbow-colored joy as they wave their banners while attending those large sporting events that are now canceled <laughs> with their simple signage reading John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that all who believe in him may not perish, but find true life. And there are other passages which bring tremendous comfort. In Matthew, come, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then there are passages that are intended to pump us up and motivate us for action. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Or just a few verses later in Philippians. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can go on. In Isaiah, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will be your strength and your help. I will hold you up with the strength of my righteous hand. One of my favorites just precedes it in Isaiah. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord our God is the everlasting God, the creator of all that is. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't grow weary. In fact, the Lord gives power to the weary and strength to the weak. Even the young get tired and weary. And men in their prime can stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired, walk, and never grow faint. These are great passages all. I love each one of them. And I can sometimes hear locker room motivational stuff in some of these verses. You know, things like, head up, hang in there. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. No pain, no gain. I think that this is what many people hear with our second reading from Romans 5, especially focused on verses 3 through 5. We are now able to boast in our sufferings, for suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Now don't misunderstand. I love these verses in Romans. But Paul is not issuing a new law of logic governing human experience for believers alone. I love the confidence that faith can inspire. I love the hope that springs eternal because of the love that God has lavished upon us. But this is not an exercise in some new form of logical deduction, which, which guarantees that suffering always and necessarily builds character and fuels hope for those who truly believe. You see, it's not a matter of believing hard enough or having enough faith, or having the right kind of faith. That's not Paul's point. The book of Romans is very clear about Paul's aim. And its roadmap is very clear in helping us figure out how to get there. Chapters 1 through 8 are perfectly organized for providing clarity. The crucial summary verse is found in chapter 1. The righteous by faith will live. And chapters 1 through 4 
describe what it means to be made righteous by faith. And chapters 5 through 8 describe what it means to live, to truly live, free from the fear of God's judgment in chapter 5, free from the power of sin in chapter 6, free from the burden of the law in chapter 7, free from the claims of death in chapter 8. And sometimes, getting an overview can really illumine the meaning of what we're reading. And then chapter 8 culminates with an incredible crescendo, paying homage to the power of God's love. I'm sure you know the words. For I am fully persuaded, Paul writes, 100% certain that nothing in life, not even death, Nothing we've done or ever could do. Nothing now, nothing ever, nothing, absolutely nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ our Lord. What a powerful hymn of praise, celebrating the, the reach and reign of God's love. Paul knew this love personally. He encountered this love on, on the road to Damascus, where after he was blinded by the light, the eyes of his heart were opened by the presence of a risen Lord, whose resurrection life was living proof that the power of God's love had conquered death. Death is not life's aim or end. God's love is life saving. This love never ends. It is surely true that to be embraced by this kind of love inspires confidence in the true aim and end of life. But this doesn't mean that life's difficulties are simply hurdles we clear or obstacles we overcome or temporary setbacks that never actually set us back. You see, when we encounter suffering in very personal terms, in us or others, simple slogans simply don't work and hardly even make much sense. My brother struggled with leukemia during the last four years of his life. And this struggle ended when he succumbed to his fatal strain of leukemia at the, at the age of 38. I wish I could have been by his side, encouraging him with the good news that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. And character produces hope, which lifts us up above life's dreary struggles with, with chronic pain, with bouts of depression, and even moments of despair. But most of the time, I found that, that we're all in this fight together, battling the lies that we find so easy to believe that suffering reveals God's displeasure with us. Or that suffering is some sort of punishment for sin. Or that it's there to remind us that we just come up short from, from what God desires or requires of us. But here in the book of Romans, Paul is proclaiming that these are lies that God's love has exposed by freeing us from our fear of God's wrath, by freeing us from the power of sin, by freeing us from the burdens of the law, by freeing us from the curse and claims of death, and embracing us with a love that knows no bounds, a love that never ends, because God's life never ends. The point of chapter 5 in Romans focuses on God's grace, overcoming his wrath with judgment, giving way to mercy and love, replacing fear 
as the way that leads to true love. We are in the midst of a pandemic. For many of us, this pandemic hasn't taken on the human face of afflicting an otherwise healthy neighbor or a vulnerable friend. But it will. And when it does, we will struggle with the lies that make it easy to trust fear, to blame sin, or simply to try harder when it comes to pleasing God. The thousands upon thousands who have been infected were not singled out because they were sinners of a particular sort. The thousands who have died did not lack faith. Human experience tells us that suffering surrounds us and afflicts us. Paul is not trying to tell us that he has found a magical formula that, that turns suffering into a good thing if we just learn to believe in the right way. Since my brother's death over 35 years ago, suffering has always taken on a human face for me. Struggling with these age-old questions is more than reflecting on a philosophical puzzle or positing a theological conclusion. And that's what Paul is doing. Paul is trying to tell us that God has revealed himself as really gracious as truly loving, as a faithful friend, a fellow sufferer who understands. God is not gracious sometimes. God is gracious. The love with which God loves us doesn't disappear when we realize we're sinners and doubters with no claims on the gifts that God gives. The line in that familiar Reformation hymn rings true. No merit of my own I claim, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. In other words, the good news of the gospel is not about focusing on us, <laughs> on who we are, what we've done, or how impressive we are as models of faith, or whatever. It really is about God actually being gracious from the core in to all actions toward us. It's about God actually being loving, promising to be with us, come what may, accompanying us through life's trials, walking alongside of us in life's valleys, and inviting us to trust that God has done what we could not, offering us a taste of new life now, and promising a share in true life forever. Blessings that are freely given and fully ours in Jesus' name.